um, less than a year ago, Rank Ocean dropped his new, uh, his new album. Very nice album, but I noticed I get Google News alerts for the word ocean. And for a couple of weeks, over half the news stories on ocean were about Frank Ocean. And it's still about a quarter of all the ocean stories. So, and I think mean, great musician, but the other 71% of the planet doesn't seem to get its true course. And, and when you look at um, you know, this old investigative reporter, you follow the money, you look for waste, for and abuse. And I guess the only stories, the only resource in the ocean not fully exploited is good storytelling. And I've had five panelists here who, unfortunately, I think represent about a quarter of the nation's uh, blue beat. But um, I'd like to introduce them briefly and let them introduce themselves uh, for, you know, again, very briefly so that we can just get into discussion of, of why there's not more salt water. Ralph Nader just said, I'm going to go home and write a story about how there's a media blackout on something like this, um, this, this level of key importance. And, um, and then we're, that, you know, we're running short, but we're going to spend half our time sort of talking about these things and then half our time letting you pitch stories. It's called Story Slam. Give us a story of an important ocean issue, and we'll tell you if it's like a story or an issue and how it could be a story and how you can engage. So briefly, um, Mark Benjamin here um, just did Ocean Warriors, a six-hour series that ran on the animal planet. It's about to go global. Um, all about pirate fishing, the pursuit, and, and the heroes who are dealing with the issue. Danny Washington has uh, been to many of these. She's all over social media and creating her own media and creating all the outlets to talk about the ocean that are non-traditional. Ian's as traditional as you get, the gray old lady there. Gray, he's uh, did the um, series, award-winning series, including a few events, the Ocean Award, on um, on ocean piracy and the use of slave labor and the linkage between organized crime and, and what we're seeing in terms of high seas fisheries. Uh, Rona is a uh, Chesapeake journal that's just really focusing on the state of Chesapeake Bay with a real focus on uh, oysters and, and nutrients and uh, she co-led a, a ocean uh, tour we took at the last Society of Environmental Journalists. Louis Soyes, uh, after a career as an award-winning National Geographic photographer, um, decided to go into documentaries and did The Cove, which uh, his first documentary won an Academy Award, and even more importantly, reduced the, the dolphin kill. I helped reduce the dolphin kill from about 23,000 to 3,000 in that cove in Japan, and done Chasing Extinction, and at the upcoming Ocean uh, Conference at the UN, it's gonna like plaster the uh, the side of the UN building with uh, living images of the ocean. So I'm going to let them each talk for just a couple of minutes, and we'll have a discussion on Loopy and open it up to you. I've, uh, I've worked for 20 years in political social documentaries, and I never did anything in conservation until 10 years ago. Uh, my, my daughter's a marine biologist, and we've been writing this ocean conservation uh, treatment for documentaries for about 20 years. And because I had been working with uh, Robert Redford, who was, you know, was a conservationist, we thought we would uh, take our our desire, my company, Work City TV, to Redford and say we want to flip the script and get out of the hood where we were making social, political, uh, police, uh, public safety problems, uh, public school failure, of public education type films for decades and decades. So Redford said, oh, great, new blood in the conservation movement, and he supported us. So I'll just fast forward. The, having Redford certainly gave us a leg up, uh, getting to a few meeting where I was asked to talk about uh, the ocean and media. I met all the uh, sort of prize-winning marine biologists, and it seemed possible. But we do one thing we had to do is do a conservation film that was serving the marine conservation subject not as medicine but as entertainment. So we came up with this ocean warrior concept which was following activists who were you know boots on the deck who were out there you know fighting the poachers, fighting the pirates, fighting the illegal fishing. And we did it with Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, Echo Warriors, uh, individuals, Echo journalists, 
And we ended up with six hours of random discovery, or Animal Planet, which is a discovery network, and then it's playing around the world now. So that's, uh, that's my Hi everybody, um, my name is Danny Washington. I am a Florida native, born and raised in Miami. Any Miami folks in the house? Anybody? Maybe one. Pull it up, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I am really, really thrilled to be here. Thank you again, David, for inviting me to be a part of the panel. And um, being here at BBS again uh, for the second time is awesome to get to see you here together. Um, but basically, my background, I, my educational background is in marine biology. I, I studied at the University of Miami, uh, finished my undergrad, and then right out of undergrad, I started working with a, a company called Untamed Science, which was creating videos for science textbooks. And they're currently in classrooms today. Um, but simultaneously, I was able to co-found co an organization called Big Blue and You with my mom, actually, because both of us have a passion for the ocean and a passion for children. And that organization is focused on educating and inspiring this generation to love the ocean using art and science combined. So really this idea of STEAM and bringing ideas and new concepts and ways to engage young people in non-traditional settings. Um, and then beyond that, I uh, currently host a television show on Fox Networks called Nature Knows Best. I'm shooting my second season right now. Literally came off the plane yesterday from Boston whale watching. We were shooting a segment on whale which I'm very excited about. And. Uh, you know, it's been a very exciting journey over the last 10 years that I've learned. I just hit 30, and becoming a science communicator, quote unquote, has really become my official title because people like Bill Nye, the science guy, inspired me when I was little, and I saw that he had an ability to communicate science in a way that was fun and engaging, and that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to continue to do, including using social media as that platform, because it's free, and we can reach as many people as we want to reach if we have clear, fun, um, beautiful content that people will be attracted to. So that's kind of my goal, and I hope that we get a chance to talk a little bit about that later. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Ian Erdogan. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. Um, I'm actually on leave right now from the paper, um, working on a continuation of a series that began the paper two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, the series is called The Outlaw Ocean, uh, and it's a look at um, lawlessness offshore and its many forms, um, uh, ranging from uh, kind of human rights and labor abuses all the way over to environmental abuses, um, so to include murder, stowaways, and gun running, sea slavery, human trafficking, intentional dumping, the list goes on. Um, <coughs> So, um, yeah, so this year uh, and good part of next, uh, continuing on that reporting globally um, for the sake of a book and uh, other outlets uh, and um, throughout the year. Hi, I'm Rona Cobell. I'm a reporter with the Chesapeake Bay Journal. Uh, we uh, cover the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay, which is 64,000 square miles, 17 million people and growing. It includes uh, the six states and the District of Columbia, the Potomac, the Susquehanna, and probably if you live around here, whatever river and creek is near you flows into the watershed. Um, we are a free newspaper that is delivered to your door. We get some of our funding from the Chesapeake Bay program. And then we get a lot of our funding from foundations and readers. So you are welcome to contribute to the Bay Journal, but you don't need to contribute to it to get a free subscription. And um, I am not as social media savvy as Danny, but uh, I, I'm frequently on Facebook and I post a lot to Chesapeake Bay Journal. So I encourage you, as, as, as with all social media, that is free. Uh, so if you go to the Chesapeake Bay Journal Facebook page, you can catch up with us there. Um, the main issues that I focus on are really agriculture, sewage treatment, runoff, um, and then the living resources, oysters, crabs, striped bass. Um, so just a couple of thoughts I had about what I, how I do what I do. Um, agriculture is really the leading cause of pollution in the Chesapeake Bay, and unlike sewage treatment plants, the fix for agriculture is very difficult. Um, agriculture is not regulated per se by the Clean Water Act, uh, only if you're an animal industrial feeding operation, but there's a lot of pollution that comes from non-industrial feeding operations and even 
from the industrial field <coughs> operation. It's regulated, but it is still permitted. And um, just for an example, to give you, you know, one of the issues that might not seem obviously connected to the oceans, but certainly is, is um, the Chesapeake Bay Peninsula uh, really narrows as it gets down to the ocean. And there's a little sliver of Virginia Eastern Shore, which is basically four miles from ocean to bay. It's a piece of land, very small and narrow. And that is where uh, the state of Virginia is permitting mega chicken farms. So you will have 12 chicken farms um, in one place, and in one case, 24 um, chicken houses. And that's a whole lot of chicken poop that's being generated, which is nitrogen and phosphorus. And it's also a significant air pollution problem with the ammonia. Uh, what goes up must come down. It's going to go down somewhere, and some of that's going to go to the ocean, which has much more of an ability to flush it out than Chesapeake Bay does. But we're seeing a lot of um, trouble in our coastal bays, which are very fragile ecosystems that attach to the ocean. Um, and I also focus a lot of my time on, we don't really want people to think of ocean issues as, as being kind of wealthy issues. There's a lot of people who can't get to the ocean and have never seen it. And so I do a lot of reporting on Baltimore City and trying to connect. Um, when we talk about clean water in Baltimore City, we're not really talking about whales and dolphins, we're talking about trash and rats. And that's an equally important message because it's all about quality of life. And whether your quality of life is, like David, you have to body surf you know, to find your happiness, or whether your quality of life is you open up your door and you hope not to see you know, rat as large as your head and 5,000 bags of potato chips, you know, that's quality of life. So I think I've tried really hard in the work that I've done to try to sort of democratize environmental coverage and let people know that it, it's not just about, you know, the critters in the water. It's about drinking water, health, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I run a little organization called the Oceanic Preservation Society, and our motto on our t-shirts used to be, uh, we're not trying to save the whole planet, just 71% uh, of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then, the last film I did uh, was called Racing Extinction. We decided we, we really needed to take care of the rest of it because it's all connected. Um, you know, we're, we're going through a, a mass extinction event right now. Uh, when, I, when I worked at National Geographic, I did uh, four stories on, about extinction. And when you're out in the, you know, the deserts of the world, because that's usually where you can find dinosaurs, you know, it's like, how did this happen? How is this possible? And you know, you're, you're blind, when you start to think of deep time, your mind goes into this, you know, what could possibly cause this catastrophe? Then about 10 years ago, I learned that there's a mass extinction event going on right now, but it's caused by us. And so I think everybody in the room probably knows it's called the Anthropocene, the Age of Man. I thought, well, I need to do a film about this. And I need to, it's, it's not enough to just do a film. We need to get it seen by as many people as possible. And is this working? Do you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, so films are great, but you, like Ralph Nader said today, the one percent of the, the people, uh, you know, one hundred percent committed to uh, a grand vision for the rest of society, and then you can create change. Uh, I think the, the figures are probably a little more like ten percent. Ten percent of the, the, the population being one hundred percent committed to an idea, then you start to have this acceleration of social ideas. I understand that. You know, with the, we, we released a uh, recent extension on Discovery Channel. It was a good, a good release for a film. Uh, for a documentary, we had 36 million people see it for the first day around the world, 220 countries and territories, and it's released on all their platforms, you know, going around the world. But we still fall pretty far short. You know, 10% uh, of the population of the world is about 750 million people. So, uh, but as part of this, I, I knew that we weren't going to have the reach, so I wanted to do these, these massive projections on iconic buildings and the the species. Um, so we, we did this uh, projection on the entire state building. This, this, this is something I've been trying to do for four years, and people said I was crazy to never be able to get it done. I said on a weekend in New York, uh, the, the press wouldn't turn out because nobody could afford press on overtime because the hours are later <coughs> in the evening. And uh, even if we could pull it off, all the important people that need to see it would be in the Hamptons or over <laughs> in, in Europe. Well, 930, 939 million people saw it by Thursday. We did it on Saturday night. We were the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter worldwide for four days. Uh, so we, we thought we couldn't get any bigger than that. Then the Pope called. 
day, he wanted to pr uh, do projections of dangerous species in the Vatican uh, during COP21 when the world leaders were meeting over uh, in Paris to decide the you know, famous accords. Uh, then he has four and a half billion people so that, or four and a half billion media impressions. So I've been concentrating on these, uh, these big projections because it's, to me it's about scale. How do you, we know that we're losing the, the oceans. If you haven't seen Chasing Coral, please see the films coming out. I think that it's through July 14th. We're losing the oceans incredibly quick. The, we, the mass extinction events, the coral reefs are always the first to go. We've lost the coral reefs before all the major, five major previous mass extinction events. And that's exactly what's going on right now. We lost 22% of the Great Barrier Reef last year. As I'm speaking right now, we look where another two thirds of it are uh, being uh, bleached this year. So it's, it's happening now. Events that people were saying, the scientists were saying that were going to happen at 2100 are now being predicted to happen as early as 2030. So our generation will probably see the, unless we do something, us in the room don't do something drastic. Uh, this could be the first major ecosystem, the global e ecosystem to collapse at the hands of mankind. So to me, it's all about speed and scale. How do we take all the information we learned at all these conferences and scale it up? And some of these projections, are, you know, I love these conferences. They give me energy. I know it does energize me when I'm sitting out in the audience. But how do you reach those people out in the world that don't give a damn about these, that don't think they give a damn about it? How do we communicate in a way so that they understand that the oceans impact everybody, and more importantly, what can they do about it? So, <laughs> okay, so media is not a substitute for social movements, but obviously social movements depend on it, and it's, it's the oxygen. Um, I, I guess I'm gonna do a quick round, and then we're gonna open it up to, uh, Part of it is how we communicate better. Clearly, you know, it, we're in the middle, as, as Louis said, we're in a, a global crisis and an emergency. You know, a fifth of uh, the Great Barrier Reef died last this, in 2016, the hottest year in record. And we thought, you know, a decade ago, we thought the melting of the ice in the Arctic would be a global alarm bell, and it turned into like a global dinner bell. And now everybody with shipping lanes and oil interests is up there. So I guess. Uh, quick one for the panel is just because I know journalists love sharing leads with each other and story ideas. Um, what are the emerging issues in the, in the ocean that you see and how, how do we make them get beyond um, the documentary format or the cover of the New York Times? And the New York Times is covering this thing, but that's not expanding into general media. Um, briefly, what, what do you see as the big stories, ocean stories? They can get out there, and how can we get them out there as people in the industry? Yes. I, I think uh, one example that's easy for everyone to see is the continent of Africa has been poached by the developing world and the uh, undeveloped world, and China in particular, because they invested about sixty billion dollars in infrastructure in Africa, feels that. They have no compulsion. They're, they're, not, they're not compelled to abide by any of the rules of, of African countries. So they poach out the country. And they're illegally fishing in the EEZ of these different uh, states along both the east and the west coast of Africa. So what's happening is coastal populations who get their protein from the ocean are forced to look for food elsewhere. So this, what you saw with the Syrian war and the migration through you know, Turkey and Greece into Europe, that's, that's like a tiny <coughs> drop in this nightmare of uh, global food security. I mean, the continent of Africa is, is sort of the place on the planet right now where we're seeing this, that if, if food security is depleted much more along different countries on Africa, both, both the African coasts, they're going to go north and they're going to end up in Libya and try to cross the pond and get to where they assume there's food. So the, the nightmare uh, that I'm currently trying to work on is migrations caused by illegal fishing. And where people are, don't have any protein and are starving, they're gonna, they're gonna, you're going to have massive movement of populations and migrations. And this is going to make the Syrian crisis of immigrants in Europe look tiny compared to the whole continent moving. 
And if you believe Boris Worm, who predicted in 2048 <coughs> industrial fishing would be over, but there just wouldn't be enough fish in the sea to support uh, massive trawlers going out because the fish stocks will have collapsed. If you believe these predictions about the end of commercial fishing, and there, it seems like there's a gold rush for building these large monster ships around the world, and to go to areas that don't have enforcement assets that can protect their shoreline, you're going to have people's uh, food supply <coughs> taken away by other people, and you're going to have massive migrations, and that's going to be a, a drama for Europe if tens of 20, 30, who knows how many million people are going to try to migrate to Europe. Well, I, I really think it, for me, when I get, when I think about all the issues that we're facing with the ocean, I get overwhelmed, um, I get depressed, you know, but what pulls me out of it is understanding and kind of narrowing things down. Uh, so in my mind, I, I consider four major issues generally when I'm talking about the ocean. If I just meet somebody randomly on the street or if I'm doing a post on Snap, I want to talk about these big four. And the four that I consider the biggest right now would be obviously climate change and acidification, um, pollution, habitat loss and destruction, and overfishing. And so when I break it down to those four parts, it helps me to really see clearer on what I want to say and how I want to say it, and actually give people that I speak to tools and how they can help those big four, right? And so the way that I think the, the most effective way is for people like us coming to these conferences who are the choir, who understand these issues, and using our platforms that we have in our hands on our smartphones every single day, and starting to craft a story, a simple story telling people that you know that are in your tribe, that are in your circle, in your community about these simple issues and what they can do to help, right, and on a daily basis. And the most important thing with that and having more people involved, especially in our ocean tribe, is to show different imagery uh, of different faces from the beautiful rainbow of humanity that we are, right, so people can see faces that look like them and they feel connected and that they can relate. And that, for me, is one of the most important things that we can do as a community and to open the door to tell authentic and compelling stories from our own lives and why the ocean is so important to us. Why do we love it? Why do we go out body surfing and, you know, paddleboarding and whatever we can to connect? I think we have to be the invitation uh, for the general mass and to get the critical mass of this world's population to understand these issues and to feel empowered to do something about it. Um, I don't have a clear thought, so I'll throw out a jumbled one. Um, one thing that strikes me is, as I try to figure out uh, kind of a, a meta um, framework to think about, um, uh, it does seem that there's a there's a broad problem with what's often referred to as externalized cost or, or sort of hidden costs. And so, if you think about climate change, you think about pollution. Uh, from the lens of externalized costs, it's the notion that the air is a bottomless wastebasket and you can dump unlimited amounts of carbon there and there'll be no cost. Well, we now know that's not true, right? The planetary cost, um, and it's not a bottomless um, wastebasket. Um, so if you use that same lens of externalized costs and, and you know, carbon cap and, and various schema, most of which have not succeeded, have been attempted to put a cost, a, a, a real accounting of that form of pollution. I personally think until we solve that, we're not gonna solve the climate change problem, until we actually honestly account for the real costs of things, be it our shoes or our iPhones. Um, if you move that same lens into the realm of the ocean space and you think of, you look at the issue through the lens of hidden costs, externalized costs, whatever your buzz term is, um, it's the same, I think it, it, there's a certain utility, um, and it helps to understand, at least for me it does. And so when you think of the ocean space and externalized costs, you see acidification and carbon <coughs> and impacts of, you know, of, of dumping waste in the air and in the water, plastics from land, for example. But you also start thinking about um, things that Daniel Pauly and others have talked about, which is the hidden costs of shrimp or of tuna or whatever. It's, it's impossible to have a can of tuna that's that cheap uh, and have it caught in the Pacific and canned in Fiji and 
ship to Connecticut and still cost two dollars. Yes, it's impossible. It's impossible because that's not its true cost. And the way that that thing costs so little is because there are all these externalized costs, these hidden costs. They come from robbing African coasts. They come from using slave labor in which high fishing fleet. They come from various methods of hiding costs. So for me, super meta sociologically, <coughs> like, I do think that approaching the ocean and thinking about these hidden costs and figuring out what are they, how much they cost, who's paying the real price, and how do we get on top of that so that in a supply chain accountability sort of way, we get a true accounting of the stuff we buy, the canned tuna, the iPhone, whatever it is, and then we pay. You know, like, and until we work out that economic reality, I think we're just going to keep, you know, racing towards extinction. <laughs> Well, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I, I just want to add something coming sort of from a, a bit of a landlocked area, but covering the bay and a little bit the ocean. Um, I had the experience last week where I got to go to a barrier island with a, a class, an Eastern Shore of Virginia class, and it was their first field trip all year. It's almost May. These are low-income kids and they live in this four miles between the coast and the ocean. And many of them, probably half of them, had never been to this barrier island, which is about two miles from, from the shore where they live. And a few of them had never been on boats. And it was amazing to see their reaction when they saw the ocean and when they saw the plants and the biodiversity and to talk about climate change and what happened. And it, I mean, it gave me a lot of hope because while you know, we have a lot of people who are denying these things are happening and they happen to be running our government, these 16-year-old kids, you know, they were not in denial. They could see it very clearly. And those field trips, I wasn't privileged enough to get to do that because I grew up in Pittsburgh, but for anybody who is close enough to the ocean, which is many of us, um, we, we can't get kids out to the Great Barrier Reef, even I can't get to the Great Barrier Reef, um, but we can get kids within you know, if they live within an hour or two of the ocean, we can get them there on a field trip and we can show them what's at stake here. And I think that is very powerful. I think what happened to those kids will stay with them for forever probably. This experience that they had, even their teacher said, they're not gonna remember me in 20 years, but they'll remember being here on this island. And I hope that that the foundations and, and the th this particular uh, trip is something the Nature Conservancy is funding. Uh, after 40 years of owning these, the, these islands, they've decided to make them really accessible and get people out there. But I'm hoping that, you know, as much as we uh, want foundations to help us cover restoration costs and uh, journalism of the ocean and this kind of thing, I think it's extremely important just to let people know what's at stake here uh, and and what they might what what might be lost and I try to do that with my own kids I take them places that I don't think are going to be here in 30 40 years so that they can say you know I was there I saw it back when it was something generation says that you know we all adapt to a diminished world and the problem is that's been, that's been going on for several generations now um, the externalization idea I mean, uh, that that was motivating me but I, I think there's there's probably about five to seven percent of the population that, that really gives a damn that you know about externalized costs I think the average person wants to know is it is it cheaper or is it better and if you can't give me that alternative you you maybe won the battle for us but you lost the war because you're not motivating culture at large when I think well, you know, the, if you're living in Iowa the story I tell somebody to anywhere actually is, if you want to save the environment, you want, to, you want to save the oceans, the easiest way to do it is to adopt more of a plant-based diet because more than, better than buying a Prius or buying a Tesla is modifying your diet to be more plant-based because the raising of, of animals for human consumption, look what goes on in Virginia, causes more greenhouse gases than the entire emissions from the transportation sector, all planes, trains, automobiles in the world. So if you want to save the world, you want to save the oceans, you can do that three times a day by adopting more of a plant-based diet. So I know this, I can tell you guys, but I'm not making a film about it now. Uh, it's being executive produced by James Cameron. 
And the, the, the idea is we, we don't tell people that you're in a safe, safe environment. They'll come towards the end of the film. But we used uh, plant-based athletes, like the world's strongest guy is a vegan. <coughs> uh, most accomplished ultra runners, plant-based. Two of the top ten boxers right now, plant-based. Tom Brady, you know, probably the most accomplished quarterback ever, has a vegan product line out. Uh, so we tell a better story. We tell a story, if you want to be big, strong, and manly, you protect the environment. You protect yourself. <laughs> Uh, the biggest cause of, 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 of diseases, heart attacks, strokes, erectile dysfunction, all related to animal products. This, I'll say, say this, was, this, is, this will change every guy in the room. <laughs> the smallest artery in your body that goes to your penis is, 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 go, is going down to put blood down there. You clog that up with animal products. Uh, one of the, the guys that, uh, the people in our, group, our, our film, uh, head of the medical association in uh, Illinois, Said so he used to be the biggest prescriber of Viagra. Now he prescribes a plant-based diet. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that's the point. Is how do you how do you tell a story to save the environment that gets at the heart of the minds and the the sexual drive of every of any planet? Because that's how you, that's how ultimately you uh, you change cultures by telling a story that uh, resonates with everybody in the room. So that was. I guess journalists are pretty facile. They give you quick and easy answers. My, some of which are pretty much what we need. Um, migration, you know, the, the idea of, of food security as a global issue tied to overfishing. It's a great one. Breaking down the overfishing, pollution, loss of habitat, climate change into simple messages that as knowledgeable people you can spread through incredible social media that wasn't wasn't there before. Um, like Ralph said, you know, when he grew up, all they taught you about the oceans was their names. When I grew up, we had three channels and one of them had, you know, Doc still on it. Um, but now we're all communicators. The idea of uh, making an economic story, full cost accounting for what we're taking out of nature and not, not considering the natural world, most of which is all water, and also, as a food story, everybody engages in food, and food is a climate impact, and, and that's why in 50 ways to save the ocean, I don't have just sustainable seafood, I have to like, eat more vegetables and get them locally, because what we discover is, you know, the good news we can tell is when you do right by the ocean, turns out you're generally doing right by yourself, by your, your health, your pocket, both your sense of well-being. So we got a few minutes left. I'd like to, we got all this skill story, hey, up here. I like uh, anybody who's got a story to tell and how you're going, how you think you can get it out. Um, give it very quickly as a story. Um, and if anybody has a story that, that they'd like to pitch, imagine you're pitching, say, to the New York Times or for the next uh, documentaries for uh, Brit TV or uh, Ocean. Uh, anyone got a story to tell? Uh, thank you all. My name is Sam Teicher. I, I work in coral reef restoration. So what I'm thinking about uh, largely has to do with what's happening to the reefs now. It's obviously in the zeitgeist. People are starting to wake up that the Great Barrier Reef is dying. And Jeff put together a truly spectacular movie around uh, what's happening to the reefs. So thinking on that, what can we also do? There aren't a lot of solutions that are put out there. And obviously, I'm biased on the restoration front, but for me, I've been a diver since I was a kid. So helping educate people what's happening to reefs and why it matters, both from an aesthetic wonder sense, but also for economic reasons, tourism, fisheries, coastal protection, the billion people around the world who could go hungry or lose their jobs. And then also touching on some of those points, how you've got Ellen DeGeneres was the place of Dory, uh, there's no Finding Nemo, Finding Dory without the Great Barrier Reef. Max Scherzer, pitcher for the Washington Nationals, probably a future Hall of Famer, his favorite thing to do with his wife is go scuba diving. So taking big voices that capture people's attention and, and adding on to this, not just what's happening, but also what we can do about it, whether it's marine planting, whether it's planting corals, whether it's putting in policies that uh, reduce fossil fuel emissions. But adding that solution element, since it's not just all doom and gloom, um, you know, having that sort of optimistic sense of what we can also do to change things. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I wish I did. I mean, my, my best shot, I just took it six hours uh, in, you know, maybe a hundred countries. 
millions of people saw it. I, I tried to present millennials because Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd and a lot of these uh, eco, save the world, save the ocean people are, are young. So by showing them working and putting their life on the line to try to save the ocean from the crimes against it, you know, whether it's piracy or, or sea slaves or the walls of oceans, I mean, right now, you, at, at that table, between Ian and Louis, you, you have the most impactful two individuals on the planet who have influence. Louis got it out to, as he said, 36 million. Ian got it out to the cognoscente who read the New York Times and, and these lengthy articles. So they've, they've actually achieved the, the ultimate exposure and saturation for a public audience. I didn't have a bad audience. Uh, I had millions also, and millions of impressions and Facebook and tweets and Twitter. But you, you've, you've got to create the programming for an audience that it has such high expectations for what they deem to be entertainment. So the problem is, is making it exciting through creative devices it, that are unique and uh, <coughs> relate to the millennial mentality, both as both intellectually and aesthetically. And I'm not sure, except for your choice in characters, who you put on the screen, who gets their attention. I mean, who like I I, I only make films and series about people I care about. So I'm an I, I'm a what you call advocacy. I'm an activist hiding behind a camera, trying to make things that will add to uh, the cure for the, the, the planet's ills. So if, if you see yourself as an activist and, and your, 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 your corner is, is ocean conservation, figure out who you care about casting. I think that's the biggest tip I have in tips, is find people who are so passionate that they're compelling and they have a magnetism it makes an audience, without trying to, they're, they're not posers for the camera, but they're just natural behind a scene and allow documentary people to film them in a way that they come off as heroes. Create heroes of marine conservation and get them on shows, whether they be on Facebook, on Vimeos, on YouTube, however you can get heroes that are saving the ocean on the screen, I think that's what you, uh, on the Carl, I've been trying to, crack the coral code, because it's not, it's like watching your, your plant's leaves grow to try to tell the coral story. So it can't be the reef. The story has to be the character who's telling the story, ultimately. That's my two cents. And that's what Jeff does. Jeff does. Uh, if you haven't seen Chasing Coral, oh, Coral is it. That's a new film, film, Chasing Coral. It's amazing. And, you saw it, yeah. right? And the public gets, I mean, in terms of what we're trying to do on the hill tomorrow and or Public gets oil spills, they get dirty beaches, they get plastic because it's ubiquitous, it's in our life all the time. Um, we, have, we don't have much time left. Dude, can I throw in one more point yes. on that? So I would just put a plug in for the kind of work that Ronnie does at, and by saying that um, numbers matter, right? You know, so trying to get a lot of people to see something matters. Um, but also there's quantity and there's quality and remembering the importance of um, the quality part in the sense that maybe going local and going deeper and a smaller audience but, but focusing on stories and issues that resonate deeply for a smaller population is also extremely important and so and that sort of touches on the sort of Freakonomics point I was trying to make which is that you know looking at individuals in isolated communities, Baltimore or Delmarva Peninsula in Chicken, um, and really looking at, um, wait, so what's going on for this community, for these workers, for these consumers, in this place, and let's go deep on that. We're not gonna resonate with the Great Barrier Reef, um, uh, which is important, but we might actually get some real concrete change here, and then it gets replicated. It's obvious, but I just don't wanna get lost in the big numbers play and forget that it's going to happen locally if it's going to happen at all. And, and just to reinforce that, I mean, if you were to panel on coastal resiliency, Admiral, um, Admiral and uh, Phillips, yes, sorry, um, for people living in Hampton Roads, sea level rise is a real issue they get. And for the, for the shellfish industry in America, ocean acidification isn't abstract. 
so we can make it local, we can make it important. We really don't have time for one more question, but since you were waving your hands early on. <coughs> oh, um, thank you. So, uh, I actually had a, a, a story or a potential story, but it's related to stories. Okay, <laughs> then um, a question. I don't think any of you are narrative filmmakers. And to follow up on what uh, Louis said about the need for scale and the need to tell story, and I think beyond story, the need related to, to movements is the need for a new myth, uh, a global myth about what our highest and most important purposes are as individuals and societies, and among those is our limits uh, and, and uh, our need to stop doing things and certain things and to change our behavior. And I think film is uniquely suited to convey myth. Okay. Uh, so can documentary film do that adequately, or does it take narrative film to do that? That's my question. And we can't answer it, but something to think about. I think we need both. Yeah. I think we just need everything and anything. I think narrative filming would be great. And just like we mentioned Finding Story and you know, Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, <laughs> both of them are great narratives for children that really instilled something special. And so if we can create more narratives for adults as well, I think that's even better. But it's really all hands on deck. Like we need everybody to jump on board here, especially us in this room. So I hope you all leave this panel inspired and ready to take some action. And uh, yeah. Thank all our panelists. All right.